science and technology will come to order. With that objection, the chair is authorizes to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Uh, welcome to today's hearing entitled, Using Technology to Address Climate Change. I'll recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement and then the ranking member. Today we will consider the use of technology to address climate change. We must take into account Americans' ability to develop innovations that will solve or mitigate challenges associated with climate change. The climate is always changing, but what remains uncertain is the extent to which humans contribute to that change. What is certain is that human ingenuity will play a significant role in resolving future environmental issues. Before we impose energy taxes or costly and ineffective government regulations, we should acknowledge the uncertainties that surround climate change research. Natural climate variability contributes to this uncertainty. Solar cycles, volcanic activity, El Nino, La Nina, temperature fluctuations, and long-term oceanic circulation patterns all are naturally occurring events that have a major impact on the climate. Other unknowns, such as the future of energy production and consumption, also create uncertainty about future predictions. Advanced nuclear reactors could change the landscape of both the developed world as well as developing economies. Here's an example of an alarmist prediction not allowing for technological advances. A recent study found that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's worst case scenario, which claimed further increasing emissions and temperatures, was based on outdated assumptions of coal usage. These assumptions didn't anticipate the American shale gas revolution and further undercut the reliability of the IPCC's findings. In the field of climate science, there is legitimate concern that scientists are biased in favor of reaching predetermined conclusions. This inevitably leads to alarmist findings that are wrongfully reported as facts. Anyone who then questions the certainty of these findings is wrongly labeled a denier. We will hear today about how the U.S. Government Accountability Office found that annual costs from worsening extreme weather events could increase as much as $112 billion annually by the year 2100. The GAO relied on studies that used outdated heat mortality rate statistics before the use of air conditioning became prevalent. This is a simple adaptation that would have changed the study's results dramatically. Predicting economic and environmental conditions hundreds of years from now while ignoring humans' capacity to innovate and adapt is irresponsible. It is also intentionally misleading the ultimate fake news. For instance, claiming that extreme weather will become more costly and deadly in the future as a result of climate change disregards inevitable advances in building materials and construction design. Instead of relying on big government to solve climate change problems, we should look to technological innovations that increase resilience and decrease vulnerability to inevitable climate change. For decades, climate policy has focused solely on emissions reduction. Overreaching and costly regulations like the Obama Clean Power Plan do little to reduce emissions. Climate mitigating technologies are much more likely to benefit the environment. Similarly, non-binding international agreements with arbitrary temperature goals like the Paris Climate Agreement do not offer any realistic solutions and come at a high price to the taxpayer. Even if fully implemented by all 195 countries, which isn't and won't happen, it would only reduce global temperature by three-tenths of a degree Fahrenheit over the next century. Technology, though, provides the solution. Carbon emissions in the U.S. have decreased significantly over the last 10 years thanks to fracking technology that has boosted access to affordable and clean burning natural gas. Throughout our history, technology has always led the way. All major breakthroughs in transportation, medicine, communication, and space exploration have occurred because of scientific discoveries. Why wouldn't technology apply to climate change, too? Recognizing this, Microsoft founder Bill Gates and other high-tech giants recently put up $1 billion to find technology-related solutions. Together, they launched Breakthrough Energy Ventures in 2016 to fund research into emerging energy and climate technologies. 
This is exactly the kind of innovative initiative we should encourage and support. To solve climate change challenges, we first need to acknowledge the uncertainties that exist. Then we can have confidence that innovations and technology will enable us to mitigate adverse consequences of climate change. Uh, that concludes my opening statement, and the gentlewoman from Texas, the ranking member, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for hers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start by expressing my disappointment that 16 months into this administration, the Science Committee has not yet uh, to receive testimony from the EPA Administrator, Scott Pruitt. Mr. Pruitt has appeared in front of multiple other committees multiple times, yet our repeated inquiries as to when we can expect him to appear in front of our committee has been met with unfulfilled assurances that a plan is in the motion. But not inviting, uh, by not inviting Mr. Pruitt to testify, we are, you are not only preventing this committee from carrying out its oversight responsibilities, but you are preventing the American public from holding him accountable for his actions. It really is not too late. I ask you to commit today to holding a full committee hearing before the August recess with Administrator Pruitt so that members of this committee can do their jobs and get answers for the American people. Today's hearing should be an opportunity to have a comprehensive discussion about the necessary climate adaptation and mitigation strategies our country needs to address climate change. Instead, today's hearing is a continuation of the majority's seemingly unending attempts to call into question climate science and promote delay instead of action. We will hear familiar stories from two of our witnesses who are making repeat appearances one of whom has testified numerous times in the past espousing the same views on climate uh, for what uh, we've heard before. Climate is a complex and critically important issue. We cannot do good oversight if we only hear from those whom we've already heard. Despite the title of this hearing, none of the witnesses invited by the majority are themselves developers of technologies used in climate adaptation. Instead, the hearing seems to be focused on setting up a false policy choice between mitigation and ad adaptation strategies. In reality, adaptation and mitigation are not either our solutions. And there is strong evidence to suggest that both adaptation and mitigation strategies are necessary. The Risky Business Project, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the 2017 National Climate Assessment all recognize that near-term and long-term benefits from mitigation and long-term benefits from adaptation are mutually achievable. Let me state this very clearly. The reality of climate change is inescapable. Our climate is warming, and human activity is a major driver of this warning. The visible impacts of climate change are everywhere. And while the Trump administration has already set us on a backward trajectory when it comes to dealing with the, with the causes of climate change, we must not permit a similar retreat when dealing with responses to climate change. And uh, let me just say that before I yield the floor, um, I'd like to note that uh, after six years with the committee, Pamitha is leaving us to work for the Union of Concerned Scientists. He started on the committee as an intern and was promoted over the years to press, then professional staff. So I want to thank him for all of his hard work and dedication, and we wish him well in his new position. And you can tell the, the scientists that we do support them. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Johnson. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs, the chairman of the Environment Subcommittee, is recognized for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Smith, for holding this important hearing to discuss climate change policy. It is crucial that U.S. policy focuses on American technological innovation to address future environmental conditions. Let me be very blunt. I firmly believe we must eliminate all costly, unjustifiable regulations and international agreements related to climate change from our policy agenda.
President Obama's Clean Power Plan and the Paris Climate Agreement were estimated to cost billions annually, despite having a negligible projected impact on the environment. The Trump administration is rightfully putting an end to these egregiously pointless measures. Instead, we should advance policies that encourage the development of technology to help mitigate and adapt to future environmental hazards, whether climate-related or otherwise. To take just one example, hydraulic fracturing drove the shale gas revolution, which lowered U.S. carbon emissions in addition to boosting the national economy. No climate regulation can claim a similar, similarly beneficial impact. Far from it. The benefits or downsides of any new technology, such as fracking, cannot always be predicted when first developed. However, one thing we can count on is that humans will continue to innovate and find solutions to address pressing problems. Our capacity for ingenuity is something that cannot and should not be discounted. This ad ability to adapt through technology must be recognized by policymakers and scientists alike. For example, claiming with certainty that islands will be uninhabitable in 20 years because rising seas will eliminate access to drinking water, as one recent study has predicted, is grossly irresponsible. Not only is it an exaggerated and unrealistic prediction, it completely ignores the potential for innovations in land use and advancements in technology like water desalinization. Ignoring innovation effectively stifles further discovery and technological advancement. Assuming the status quo will remain, will remain in terms of technology and climate response ignores American ingenuity, which has driven economic progress and environmental improvements around the world. It would be foolish to craft policy in such a narrow-minded, stasis-reliant um, stasis manner. I look forward to testimony from our witnesses today that will identify the folly of climate alarmism and emphasize the need for a robust debate on the future of climate policy. Chairman Smith, I thank you for holding this hearing, and I thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I yield back the balance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Biggs, and the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, the ranking member of the Environment Subcommittee, is recognized for her statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Johnson, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Climate change is an important issue to our constituents and to our country. Today we should be having a robust conversation about climate adaptation and mitigation technologies and policies. We should not be using valuable time trying to discredit established scientific facts. The Science Committee should not be a forum where the human role in climate change is still debated. What would be best for our constituents would be working on in a bipartisan manner to determine the best course of action to help them deal with the reality of a quickly changing climate. The consequences of climate change are well known and our understanding about how to address the causes of climate change continues to improve. We can no longer sit back and debate the merits of taking action. The time is now. It's critical that we support scientific research about climate and that we build on rather than break down decades worth of progress on this issue. Several of today's witnesses will try to present a false choice between climate adaptation and mitigation, but we know that these strategies go hand in hand. In my home state of Oregon, devastating wildfires tore through the region last summer, endangering lives, harming local tourism, and resulting in significant losses for the timber industry. Although it is not possible to say that climate change causes a particular extreme weather event, we need to know more about how climate change increases the frequency and severity of these events. Mitigation can provide near-term relief and help make sure communities are prepared to keep their families safe, but adaptation is necessary to address the larger issue of increasing frequency of severe weather events. Coastal communities in Northwest Oregon are facing the consequences of ocean acidification, rising sea temperatures and levels, hypoxia and other environmental stressors. Local shellfish growers and commercial fisheries are seeing the direct effects of climate change in their industries. Both mitigation and adaptation strategies can help people in the district I represent and across the country who are directly affected by droughts, rising sea levels, flooding and severe weather. The challenges, of course, are not unique to Oregon. In Alaska, for example, more than 30 towns and cities may need to relocate, costing hundreds of millions of dollars, because the permafrost is thawing and destabilizing the infrastructure. These issues deserve attention. We should be directing more resources to the full range of potential solutions that are available, rather than continuing to debate whether humans contribute to climate change, which the rest of the world considers settled.
I'm especially pleased that Dr. Phil Duffy from the Woods Hole Research Center is here to provide a scientific perspective on climate change and discuss the need for more federal research on global change. I also look forward to discussing the need for prompt action on climate adaptation and mitigation rather than encouraging inaction with claims of uncertainty. I hope the day comes soon when this committee can talk about and work on bipartisan solutions to address the important issue of climate change. And Mr. Chairman, as I yield back, I want to join Ranking Member Johnson in thanking Pamatha for his six years of uh, dedication and uh, good work to this Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bonamici. And before I introduce our witnesses today, let me say that we are actually missing one uh, individual, and, and she is not able to be with us. Uh, her flight was canceled, uh, not because of extreme weather, no. That is, and uh, this is Judith Curry, and we wish she had been able to come, but without objection, her written testimony will be made part of the record, and uh, hopefully she'll be able to testify at another time. Our first witness today is Mr. Oren Cass, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute where he focuses on energy, environment, and anti-poverty policy. Mr. Cass was the domestic policy director for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign in 2012. In this role, he helped shape campaign policy and communication on a variety of issues ranging from health care to energy to trade. Prior to joining the Manhattan Institute, Mr. Cass was a management consultant for Bain & Company, where he advised global companies on implementing growth strategies and performance improvement programs. Mr. Cass holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Economy from Williams College and a Juris Doctor from Harvard University, where he was an editor and the vice president of the Harvard Law Review. Our next witness is Mr. Ted Nordhaus, founder and executive director of the Breakthrough Institute. He is a recognized author, researcher, and political strategist in climate and energy policy. Mr. Nordhaus is the co-author of Breakthrough, the widely distributed book that was reviewed as, quote, a vital strain of realism, end quote, by Time magazine. His opinion and editorial writings have been published in the Harvard Law and Policy Review, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Scientific American, and other nationally distributed media. Over the years, Mr. Nordhaus has received the Green Book Award and Times Heroes of the Environment Award. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Dr. Phil Duffy, our third witness, is President and Executive Director of Woods Hole Research Center. Prior to joining WHRC, Dr. Duffy served as a senior advisor in the White House National Science and Technology Council and as a senior policy analyst in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Before this, Dr. Duffy was the chief scientist for Climate Central, Inc. He has held senior research positions with Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and visiting positions at the Carnegie Institute for Science and the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. Dr. Duffy was the recipient of the United Nations Association Global Citizen Award. He holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard University and a PhD in applied physics from Stanford University. Uh, we welcome you all, appreciate your presence and your effort to get here. Uh, it wasn't easy for everybody. And uh, Mr. Cass, if you'll begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. And thank you again for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. Uh, my name is Oren Cass. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, where my work addresses environmental policy, including climate change economics. My primary message to the committee is this. The assumptions that we make about how human society, society will adapt to climate change are central to our understanding of the challenges that the phenomenon presents and the costs that it will impose. Analyses that do not properly account for adaptation describe an alternative universe that does not exist. The estimates they produce are not plausible forecasts of future costs and should not be credited by policymakers. Let me pause here to clarify that this issue does not concern climate science, and also to clarify that I would agree with the opening remarks that mitigation as well as adaptation is an important part of addressing climate change, and both of those points are addressed in my written testimony as well. I believe policymakers should use mainstream climate science as the starting point for their work, but we depart the world of climate science for that of climate economics when we turn to the question of how those changes will affect human society via their influence on public health or infrastructure or the economy. The common failure to consider adaptation has profound consequences for how people conceptualize climate change 
leading to what I call climate catastrophism. If the entire brunt of a century of climate change were to land on civilization tomorrow, the result might well be catastrophic. But if those changes occur gradually, as they are expected to, if they emerge in a world far wealthier and more technologically advanced than today's, as we expect it to be, and if policymakers ensure that people have the information and incentives to plan well, something over which we have control, then climate change will impose real costs, but ones that we should have confidence in our ability to manage. I'd like to briefly show what happens when we do this wrong and do not take account of adaptation properly. Uh, these are results of some recent studies uh, that I describe the details of in my written testimony and which I'd be happy to answer questions about in more detail as well. The first is from a study published in 2015 in Nature that looked at the relationship between year-to-year -year variations in temperature and year-to-year -year variations in economic growth across countries. And what they found was that there's a relationship. Some temperatures are better than others for growth. And they extrapolated that relationship out through the end of the century, essentially assuming that by the end of the century, countries will react every year to significantly warmer temperatures as if they came from out of nowhere. What you're seeing here is the GDP per capita estimates produced by the study. You see essentially that China and India never grow wealthy because they become too warm. The United States does continue to grow, but by the end of the century has essentially flatlined. And if we begin to move higher up the chart, we reach Mongolia, uh, which achieves per capita income roughly four times that of the United States, thanks to the warmer temperatures it would experience. Or if we move even higher, we eventually reach all the way to Iceland at per capita incomes of 1.5 million, again, because warmer temperatures would imply higher growth rates in perpetuity, higher growth rates in perpetuity. Now, these are obviously, in some cases, the outlying or extreme examples from the study, but I think that that's the point, that if you don't consider the fact that these relationships will not simply hold unchanged, you end up with absurd results. I'd like to look next at a study, excuse me, sorry, if we can skip to the next slide, flip through this. Next slide, thank you. I'd like to look next at the GAO assessment of climate costs published last fall, which looked at two syntheses of costs for the United States. On the left is one published by the EPA, and on the right, one published by rhodium. The rhodium study finds most of its costs from extreme heat deaths, literally it being so hot that tens of thousands of people die. The EPA study finds even higher costs from declines in air quality. And if we flip to the next slide, this is the EPA finding that for both ozone and particulate matter, which have declined substantially in just the last 15 years, a very small uptick would essentially be the largest and in fact majority of all costs of climate change in the United States. Uh, this assumes that despite all progress to date, there is no further progress and we reduce pollution no more throughout the rest of the century. And finally, if we flip to the last slide, this is my favorite, EPA looks at heat-related deaths and produces a chart that at first glance seems reasonable. Baseline in 2000, you see very small red dots, not a lot of deaths. By 2100, it's hotter and you see more deaths. Uh, but if you click ahead one click, notice what this implies, that the deaths in the north in 2100 will be dramatically higher than in the south in 2000. And if you flip ahead one more time, this is again the data on the EPA website, showing that if we assume cities don't adjust in any way, Deaths in places like Pittsburgh, Detroit, and New York will be 50 to 75 times the rate we see in Phoenix, Houston, and New Orleans today. This is obviously not what is going to happen. It's not a responsible way to conduct economic analyses, and we should not be using it as the basis for policymaking. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cass, very much. Uh, Mr. Nordhaus. Does that work? Great. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to testify today. Um, my name is Ted Nordhaus, and I am the founder and executive director of the Breakthrough Institute. We're an environmental think tank located in Oakland, California. Uh, my think tank counts among its, among its senior fellows a number of prominent climate scientists, technologists, and social scientists. And my testimony today will draw upon this work to present a synthesis reflecting our assessment of the nature of climate risk, the uncertainties associated with action and inaction, and pragmatic steps that we might take today to address those risks. To begin, let me offer a few observations about climate science and climate risk. Uh, 
First, there is a well-established scientific consensus regarding atmospheric uh, anthropogenic climate change. Global temperatures are rising, and that rise has been caused in significant part by greenhouse gas emissions resulting from the combustion of fossil fuels. Second, and to the best of my knowledge, none of the witnesses called today for either the majority or the minority contest these well-established facts. Third, there are a range of uncertainties beyond this consensus about the sensitivity of the climate, the likelihood of specific climate impacts, the capacity for adaptation, and the cost of mitigation that provide ample justification for either far-reaching and immediate action or no action whatsoever. So how then should policymakers respond? Let me first address climate mitigation. Efforts to cap, price, and regulate greenhouse gas emissions have not much affected the trajectory of emissions anywhere to date. Under the best of circumstances, they have modestly tipped the scales toward lower carbon fuels and technologies. For this reason, the success of efforts to substantially drive decarbonization to levels that diverge from business as usual trajectories will depend primarily upon the availability of low carbon technologies that are cheap and scalable. Presently, there are important short term steps that federal policymakers can take to assure that America sees continuing declines in emissions. Most importantly among these are measures to keep America's existing fleet of nuclear reactors online. We should also abandon misguided efforts to bail out the coal industry. Reducing atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases to levels sufficient to much alter the trajectory of climate change, however, will require a concerted and collaborative effort between the public and private sectors to develop a range of low-cost, low-carbon technologies for the 70% of emissions in the United States that emanate from outside of the power sector in the industrial, transportation, and agricultural sectors. These include advanced nuclear energy, carbon capture, advanced renewable and geothermal energy, and long-term energy storage capabilities. Even in the best case, however, decarbonization efforts alone are unlikely to limit global temperatures to two degrees Celsius. For this reason, climate adaptation will play a large role in determining how well human societies weather a changing climate. Infrastructure, seawalls and flood channels, modern housing and transportation networks, water and sewage systems and similar are what makes us resilient to extreme climate events. As such, there are few things more impactful that this Congress could do than to substantially uh, increase national investment in infrastructure. Um, so too, recommitting ourselves to ensuring a comprehensive federal response to all natural disasters for all of America's citizens. So to summarize, climate change is real, its origins are primarily anthropogenic, and it presents risks that are difficult to quantify but could be catastrophic. For this reason, reasonable measures to mitigate and adapt to climate change are prudent. But climate policy deb debates have too often overemphasized mitigation at the expense of adaptation, focused on decarbonization at the expense of other mitigation pathways, attempted to make dirty energy expensive rather than clean energy cheap, and focused heavily upon renewable energy technologies to the exclusion of the broad sweep of large, low carbon technologies that will likely be necessary to deeply decarbonize the global economy. So let me close finally with a, a call for moderation and humility on both sides of the aisle in place of bombast, alarmism, and denial. In the face of irresolvable uncertainties that the issue presents, America and the world will be better served by turning down the rhetoric and focusing on pragmatic measures to mitigate climate risk and adapt to risks that we won't be able to avoid. Thank you very much for considering my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Nordhaus and Dr. Duffy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to appear here today. Uh, in my remarks this morning, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, the threat of global climate change, but I, I do want to mention that I started my career uh, in uh, the nuclear weapons complex uh, at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where I worked on uh, 
uh, nuclear weapons testing and also on uh, protecting the United States against the threat of nuclear ballistic missile attack. Uh, the threat that I've devoted the bulk of my career to uh, global climate change, I believe, uh, to be equally important. Uh, in my remarks this morning, I'm going to focus on some of the science of climate change uh, and on uh, the role uh, of technologies in addressing it and on uh, the leadership and business opportunities that I believe uh, this presents. The fact of global warming should be uh, beyond question. Uh, so I won't review here uh, the mountain of observational evidence we have documenting warming of the planet and associated related changes uh, such as increases in some form of extreme weather, uh, thawing permafrost, uh, and so on. The scientific consensus on human causation of climate change is as strong as a consensus on uh, the fact of climate change itself. And I would like to quote from volume one of the fourth National Climate Assessment. This was released uh, last November uh, by the Trump uh, administration, and I quote, this assessment concludes that it is extremely likely that human activities, especially emissions of greenhouse gases, are the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century. There's no convincing alternative explanation. Governments also recognize human causation of climate change. As of now, every country in the world is a party uh, to the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, it makes no sense to be part of that agreement if you do not recognize not only the seriousness of the climate threat, but the human role uh, in causing that threat. Turning to technologies, uh, we need technologies for mitigation of climate change, that is, preventing unacceptable climate change, uh, for adaptation, that is, coping with unpreventable climate change, and we also need technology for measuring uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. And, and my top line message this morning is that I hope our government will lead the development of these technologies, not only because we need them, but because once again, uh, this presents an opportunity uh, for the US research and business communities, and that's an opportunity that if we don't take advantage of, uh, someone else will. For mitigation, uh, I, my, my first recommendation would be to accelerate deployment of the technologies we have now, uh, namely wind and solar. Uh, we also do, of course, need new technologies for energy generation, for energy storage, uh, and energy transmission. And uh, because we've delayed so long in implementing effective climate policies, we now also need uh, technologies to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And while we're developing those technologies, we do have an important opportunity to implement land management practices, which can pull a significant quantity of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, and those same land management practices, like uh, reforestation and restoring wetlands and so on, also have important benefits uh, for climate adaptation. Turning now to adaptation, we need a host of technologies for coping with uh, the range of climate impacts. Uh, these include uh, extreme weather, uh, infectious disease, uh, water contamination, water scarcity, food scarcity, uh, and so on. The good news is that adaptation measures are generally cost effective because, in fact, we're generally under-adapted and under-prepared for uh, the climate we have today. Uh, and if you doubt that, you need look no farther than Houston uh, or Puerto Rico. Finally, I want to mention we do need technologies to better measure uh, greenhouse gas emissions. They say that you can't control what you can't measure, uh, and any effective climate policy needs reliable uh, techniques for measuring greenhouse gas emissions. So in closing, I I'd like to encourage you to support American efforts to do the research and to develop the technologies that we need uh, to tackle climate change. Addressing this threat, uh, it's an opportunity for an American leadership uh, that I would hate to see us miss. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Duffy, and I'll recognize myself for questions. And Mr. Cass, let me direct my first one to you. Uh, you put up a couple of slides today. One had to do with the number of heat deaths 
um, uh, increasing exponentially, particularly in the, in the Northeast. Um, would you go into just uh, some quick detail as to why that study was flawed? And you mentioned uh, the uh, rhodium uh, study as well, but take your pick. Just why are some of these studies flawed, and why should we sort of discount them? Sure, thank you. I think uh, to understand conceptually why they're flawed, it's important to recognize that uh, all regions, even within the United States, adapt to their local climate. And so when you look across the country, you find, for instance, that people in the hotter parts of the country are not suffering from higher heat-related mortality than people in the cooler parts. The logical conclusion to draw from that would be that as the country gets warmer, uh, we should not expect to see a lot more heat-related deaths because, again, people will adapt to whatever heat they face. And indeed, that's what the most recent published literature shows. What studies do instead to generate large heat death estimates is to look at the reaction we have seen historically, even per hot day or per days that are especially hot for a, loca for a location, and simply extrapolate forward, if we see many more hot days, then surely we will see that many more deaths. And the EPA study is the best example of this, where they take a city like Pittsburgh and they say, if 1% of Pittsburgh days have lows above 71 degrees, we will call that extreme heat for Pittsburgh. And whatever the death they, rate they experience on those days, they will continue to experience that death rate on, dates above, on days when the temperature is above a low of 71, even if that becomes very common in the future. And so you see the death rate in Pittsburgh skyrocket, if you assume that. Of course, if the climate in Pittsburgh shifts to be more like that of a more southerly city, uh, Pittsburgh's use of air conditioning and other adaptive technologies will shift as well, and the result will likely be that we will see the same low death rate that we do today. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cass. Uh, Mr. Nordhaus, I appreciated your good point that given the uncertainties, we all could uh, use some moderation and humility. A uh, good reminder. Uh, what I wanted to ask you about is you mentioned that we couldn't just rely upon renewable energy. We need to use, make better use of fossil fuels. Would you go into some detail or give examples of what you're talking about? Well, I, I think the primary uh, point that I would want to stress to this committee, uh, a couple of things. The first is that um, uh, whatever we may think we should do, the evidence is pretty strong. 70% uh, of U.S. Uh, energy, over, well over 70% of U.S. primary energy still comes from fossil fuels. That's tr true globally. Uh, and despite um, uh, long-standing efforts that has not changed very much uh, going all the way back to the oil shocks of the 1970s. Um, so um, part of that, uh, we could do better. Uh, part of that, uh, there are a lot of uses of fossil fuels that we don't have very good alternatives for. Um, uh, we spend a lot of time arguing and talking about um, various technological pathways in the power sector, which is a little bit like looking for your keys uh, under the light post, because that's where the light is. That's the easy place um, where there really are good, al good options for decarbonization, uh, so we like to argue about that. <clears throat> but once you get outside of the par power sector into industry, heavy transportation, and agriculture, it gets much harder. Um, secondly, in the developed world, there are uh, very significant trade-offs. Uh, the things that make us uh, resilient to climate extremes, whether they are caused by climate change or just normal climate variability, are infrastructure. And infrastructure, building infrastructure, is a really energy intensive business. Um, steel, cement, things like that. Um, and again, those are exactly the sectors we don't have particularly good alternatives, uh, low carbon alternatives in. So for that reason, I think there's important trade-offs, especially when we think about poor countries and their use of fossil fuels that we need to keep in mind in terms of their what will make those countries in the coming decades most resilient to a changing climate. Right. Thank you, Mr. Nordhaus. And, and Dr. Duffy, appreciated your mention of technology. Obviously, I agree with that. Uh, you mentioned your background uh, and your experience, let's call it, with nuclear energy. At least that's where you started at Lawrence Livermore. And I'm wondering if you feel that if we do develop uh, nuclear fusion, as many expect to in the next 10 years, isn't, I mean, there's almost nothing else we could do that would have more of a dramatic impact on reducing carbon emissions, I think, than nuclear 
uh, fusion. Do you agree with that, or what impact do you think that would have if we came up with a uh, cost-effective way of producing that kind of energy? Well, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. I, I just want to clarify my experience uh, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab was with nuclear weapons. Yeah, I knew that. I was not actually. <laughs> and, um, but it's still nuclear. I was hoping I'm, you could. I'm proud to be a tree hugger, but I don't think there's too many tree huggers who've detonated nuclear bombs. Okay. Uh, as far as as far as nuclear f fusion goes, I mean it's been uh, 30 years in the future uh, for at least uh, 30 years. Okay. Uh, I, I I will say I, I do support uh, Mr. Nordhaus's uh, opinion that we need to make uh, better use and more extensive use uh, of nuclear fusion. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Doctor. I'm going to do something that I don't do very often, and that is, uh, without addressing you and myself, an additional minute. And the reason I'd like to do so is that because uh, Dr. Curry is not here, but I would like to put up a slide that I was going to use had she been here. And I'd like all members to take a look at this. And you will see that for the last 100 years, uh, sea level rise has been uh, basically constant. It's been going up at about 1.8 millimeters per year, and you'll see uh, that there appears to be no correlation between the increase in the sea level and uh, carbon emissions. And I just uh, want to put that up there for our edification. I was going to ask uh, Dr. Curry about it, but I think it kind of speaks for itself. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to comment on that, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, you've, sh you've shown a sea level record from one location. Right. Uh, this is San Francisco. Which is San Francisco. I've looked at also Boston, which the, appears to be the, the, the same. The rate of global uh, sea level rise has accelerated and is now four times faster than it was uh, 100 is, years ago. Is this chart inaccurate then? It's accurate, but it doesn't represent what's happening globally. It represents what's happening uh, at, okay. in San Francisco. All the charts I've seen, whether it be San Francisco, whether it be Boston, or anywhere else, show about the same degree of increase. I'm welcome to look at whatever you want to uh, propose, but this is... Uh, be, be happy the, to show that. To these you. are uh, objective charts that I've seen. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Duffy. Uh, that concludes my questions, and the ranking member, uh, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for hers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, our understanding of Earth's uh, climate system continues to improve, and with this, within some of our lifetimes, we've seen the accuracy of our short-term weather forecast improve dramatically. As a matter of fact, just the time that I've been in Congress, we've seen improvement in travel. Yesterday, for example, it took me about seven hours to get here from Dallas, Texas, because of the weather. And we didn't see the weather, but it was predicted. Uh, and uh, we made it when we got here. So, uh, Dr. Duffy, how do you respond to those who suggest that we cannot adequately anticipate the consequences of climate change in order to develop effective mitigation and adaptation strategies? No, no, thank you for the question, Ranking Member Johnson. Um, I would say this, you know, that the, the climate models that we have uh, do faithfully reproduce uh, the broad outlines of physical climate change, and these include uh, increases in uh, the global temperature, uh, polar amplification, that is more uh, rapid warming, particularly in the North Pole, uh, increases uh, in precipitation and extreme precipitation, although those are actually underpredicted uh, by climate models. Uh, the models also predict loss of sea ice, although again, they've underpredicted the observed rate uh, of loss of sea ice, and similarly, um, the models predict loss of land ice, but once again have underpredicted uh, the rate that that's occurred. Uh, the models predict stratospheric cooling, uh, thawing permafrost, increases in heat extremes. All of these phenomena have been very accurately represented in models. And I'm glad that you actually mentioned numerical weather prediction because there is a connection between uh, making climate projections and numerical weather prediction. And actually, some of the European centers that do a very, very good job at day-to-day -day weather forecasting use literally the same computer program for their climate predictions that they use uh, to predict day-to-day uh, -day weather. And again, those are, are literally the best uh, weather forecasts in the world today. Thank you very much. If we veer away from looking into climate change and its effects and look in another direction or deny it's there at all, uh, I think we'll fail to improve our predictions. Uh, 
And wh where do you think that will take us? Because if we can stop, if we can stop anything we want to here, but it doesn't stop climate change. We can deny it happens, but it does happen. And so if we look the other way and decide that we're not going to research, what do you think the outcome might be? Well, 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 thank you for the question. You know, the, the, the outcomes from unmitigated climate change are, are not pretty, and, and I'm very happy to hear both of my co-witnesses uh, supporting the need for both mitigation uh, and adaptation. You know, one of the things that I'm most concerned about uh, with climate change is the possibility, the threat of crossing so-called uh, thresholds and tipping points. Uh, and what, what that means essentially is, is processes which once underway uh, become irreversible. Uh, and uh, one of those is the thawing of permafrost, which I mentioned. Uh, permafrost is in, in mostly in the Arctic, it sounds far away, but there's an enormous quantity of carbon tied up uh, in frozen permafrost. Uh, it's starting to thaw, it's starting to release greenhouse gases. That threatens to become an unstoppable process which would greatly amplify uh, global warming. Uh, and I'll just mention one more, and that is the decay of the major land ice sheets. Similarly, uh, those processes are probably slow, uh, but we may be very near the point where they become unstoppable and, and therefore commit the planet to many, many meters uh, of sea level rise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, with that objection, I'd like to put in the record, this is an op-ed in today's Wall Street Journal uh, by Fred Singer. Uh, he is a professor emeritus of environmental science at the University of Virginia, and he founded the Science and Environmental Policy Project. Uh, the headline on this op-ed is, The Sea is Rising, But Not Because of Climate Change. Uh, we'll now go to the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, for his question. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me just note, uh, before I ask any questions, that I, uh, I have, in my career, been very supportive of trying to develop certain technologies that I consider to be more efficient at providing the energy needs uh, for the people of the world, whether it's uh, uh, nuclear energy, which we're talking about now. And by the way, I would hope, Mr. Chairman, that we don't focus on, on the development of nuclear energy that is uh, uh, least likely to be developed. We can actually do fission reactors now that are very efficient and, and, and come to play in this uh, issue as compared to fusion, which it seems always to be 20 years away, 30. And, and 30 years away, and always will be. Uh, we, can, we can produce uh, safe nuclear uh, reactors right now if we focus on fission and quit wasting <laughs> our money on, on fusion, but that's just where I, a disagreement. Thank you. Um, but also, you know, I believe in solar and wind and all the rest of these, as long as they pencil out, uh, and what we need is a new battery technology, which I understand is on the way, when those things will actually become profitable and people will naturally go in that direction. Because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't the amount of carbon that, that is put in the air reflect the fact that we are not efficiently producing energy? Isn't that, isn't that what we're talking about here? I believe so. But when you come down to this debate over adaptation versus mitigation, there's an insistence on what you're talking about when, when people talk about mitigation, that we control human behavior rather than having people naturally evolve uh, in response to that need. And uh, so I'm a little bit disturbed by number one, that we, uh, that just uh, over and over again I hear, don't ever talk about whether or not mankind is, is the ma main cause of of the temperature changing and the climate changing. That's a little disturbing to hear constantly beaten into our heads in a science committee meeting when, when basically we should all be open to, to points of different points of view. Because the uh, answer that we've been given in terms of mitigation versus adaptation is that we need controls over people's lives and let make their decisions for them rather than adapt economically and elsewise. Um, 
Let me ask you whether or not any of you on the panel would agree that solutions, uh, is, uh, I've read a number of, of studies that have indicated there's certain solutions that are being advocated. One study was is that we should be eliminating pets, dogs. Dogs should be eliminated, and that's, that's part of their solution that we're gonna do that. Uh, there was a, a one that talked about ending frequent flyer miles, and others, of course, who uh, talk about how we need to a major increase in parking fees and gas taxes. Now, do any of you on that panel agree that that, that approach, no more dogs, you can't have a dog as your pet, we're going to outlaw those things, and no more frequent flyer miles, by the way, Ordinary people benefit from frequent flyer miles. And dogs. And, and dogs. Now you have to see them on the airplanes, actually. And uh, versus uh, in major increases in parking fees. Do any of you support that type of human control in order to come to grips with what you're telling us is absolutely undebatable, the man caused uh, global warming? Do any of you agree with any one of those solutions? Go ahead. No, okay. um, I will. Right. I will. Uh, I, I will say that, um, and I, as I uh, indicated in my written testimony, I think that modest tax regulatory pricing policies can help modestly move us at a cost-effective way towards lower carbon technologies. But the underlying sort of fundamental fact that will determine how far we get will be the availability of low cost. Uh, low carbon technologies, and that's going to retire a lot of continuing innovation. And like as I say, the amount of carbon going into the air reflects that that technology is not as efficient as other means. Now, those of us who don't believe that we should be expanding the control of government over our lives and that people should actually have more, more decisions rather than less, uh, that that is... Uh, uh, that's the area of the contention that I see here. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much for this hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warbrocker. And the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and thank you again to our witnesses. Um, Dr. Duffy, you mentioned uh, when you were talking about clean, renewable energy sources, you mentioned wind and solar. In Oregon, off our coast, we're doing some great research on wave energy and harnessing the power of the oceans. There's so much potential there. Our economy in the Northwest is really dependent on the health of the ocean and the, of course, lower Columbia River estuary, and people fish in our rivers and lakes and oceans and hike in our forests. We rely on those natural resources to support a significant portion of our economy. Uh, and many of those are vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And my constituents are already experiencing some challenges. We have wineries and farmers who are very concerned about drought uh, as temperatures continue to rise. Our coastal communities are worried about the vitality of the commercial fishing and shellfish, in shellfish industries as high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are changing ocean chemistry. And I know they're working hard on, on adaptation, uh, but they're also very concerned about why those uh, the ocean conditions are changing and, and how they're changing. We've had uh, higher than usual spring and summer temperatures and earlier snow melt. Uh, changing the dynamics of the tourism industry. And we understand that climate change can have significant effects on the economic stability of a region or a nation. Uh, so would you talk a little bit about how the, this economic growth could be stalled as a result of these challenges, but also importantly, what, are the, what is the cost of inaction? Uh, my colleague was just pointing out that renewables uh, make sense when they pencil out, but what, what are the costs of not taking action? Well, thanks, thanks so much for the question. I mean, you, you, you just mentioned, I mean, you just partially answered your own question. You meant, list, listed uh, a number of, of, of local impacts of climate change that are happening now are affecting folks in your district. Uh, I also uh, come from a coastal region. We have very, actually very, very similar concerns. A big part of our uh, local and regional economy uh, is based uh, on fishing. Uh, we have serious problems with rapid ocean warming. Uh, with sea level rise uh, and snow on and so on, uh, you know, you, you ask, you know, what are the economic concerns? I mean, there's a range, uh, including uh, consequences uh, of uh, extreme weather, uh, impacts on food scarcity, impacts uh, on water scarcity, uh, and on and on. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. You know, we've had a lot of conversations in this committee about the cost of regulation, and especially with things like the Clean Power Plan. Um, and should there be a regulation, should the market or technology uh, uh, solve the problem? Does not regulation drive the development of technology? If there is a regulation, uh, does not that encourage the, the, um, the private sector and researchers to develop the technologies that we need to comply with regulations, Dr. Duffy? You know, that's a great question, and, and I, you know, as, as you, I think you know, I worked for years in California, and there was a, a, a fascinating study done of the effect of uh, regulation of both energy efficiency and refrigerants on uh, the cost of refrigerators, and what it showed is that the cost of refrigerators historically went up, 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 up uh, until uh, the onset of regulation, at which point uh, the cost of refrigerators went down, 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 down as the size of the refrigerators and their energy use, uh, well, the energy use went down, the size continued to, to increase. So yes, actually regulation can uh, be a stimulant uh, for, for technological uh, innovation. I also wanted to mention we had a lot of wildfires in Oregon last year. We had unusually hot and dry conditions, and of course the fires and smoke created dangerous conditions for all populations, but especially with you know women, seniors, children, uh, people living with chronic health conditions, and even residents living miles away found ash uh, throughout their neighborhoods. So could you discuss the difference between committing resources to understanding the connection between climate change and extreme weather events and simply, simply adapting to those events as we experience them? Well, uh, no, thanks for the question. And you know, you, you mentioned wildfire specifically. Uh, there have been huge increases, uh, a six-fold increase in area burned by wildfire uh, in the western U.S. Uh, in the last 30 years. Some of that is due to changes in forest management practices. I saw a study recently that attributed roughly half of the increase in area burned uh, to human-caused climate change. It's not hard to understand why that would be. Uh, the fire season is longer. Uh, temperatures are hotter. Uh, by the end of the fire season, we have a lot of fuel uh, that's getting awfully, awfully crispy. Uh, and, and we have had record numbers of fires and record amounts of area burn. Right. And, and uh, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Motomichi. And the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, is recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ever since human beings have been on the planet, sea levels have risen relative to ground levels. Why is that? Any of you can opine as you wish. Uh, well, I'd be happy to address that. Um, sea levels over the last three million years have gone up and down uh, in line with the cycles of uh, ice ages uh, and interglacials, and I can ex expound on the science of that if you wish. Uh, the recent uh, the last 100-year increase in sea level rise, as I mentioned earlier, has uh, clearly been uh, attributed to uh, human activities, uh, greenhouse that gas emissions. That wasn't my question. I appreciate your wanting to expound on that. Yeah. My statement is that since human beings have been on Earth, sea levels have risen. What are the factors that have caused it to rise? Well, as, as I said, uh, sea levels have gone up and down. Uh, I'm talking net not fluctuations. Over Let's assume for a moment that what you're talking about has some kind of factual, rational basis for mm -hmm. it, uh, that ice has melted. Are there other factors? No, look, you know, looking No, there at, are not other factors? Looking yes at the no? history of sea level rise uh, is, is, very, uh, is very informative. And we, one of the things we see, for example, is that the last time uh, the global temperature was as high as it is. Hey, Dr. Duffy, you're not answering my question again. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm conceding for the moment that there has been ice meltage compared to what it was three million years ago, whatever, since that's the time frame you use. I'm asking another question, that is, what other factors have caused the sea levels to rise relative to dry land? Does anyone else have any... I mean, you, in, okay, in particular, you, Dr. Duffy, you said are, that they're going to be massive. Isn't that the word that you use in your uh, remarks? Massive sea level rises. Don't you think if you're going to have that kind of statement, you ought to have some idea as to what all the causes of sea level rises have been sure. since and human if, beings if, have been if on you're, Earth? If you're referring to ground subsidence, uh, that is a factor in some regions. Okay, what else? That's one. So now we've gotten two. 
What else? Ground subsidence is not going to cause uh, the, the levels of sea level rise that arouse my concern. I'm just asking for factors. I, would not, I was not asking for your prioritizing of one over the other, but you've mentioned two. What else? Those are all that I know of. What about erosion? Every single year that we're on Earth, you have huge tons of silt deposited by the Mississippi River, by the Amazon River, by the Nile, by every major river system, and for that matter, creek, all the way down to the smallest systems. And every time you have that soil or rock, or whatever it is that is deposited into the seas, that forces the sea levels to rise because now you've got less space in those oceans uh, because the bottom is, is moving up. Um, what about um, I'm, I'm pretty the, sure the White that that's Cliffs a, of Dover, uh, California, uh, where you have the waves crashing against the shorelines, and time and time again you're having the cliffs crash into the sea. All of that displaces water, which forces it to rise, does it not? I, I'm pretty sure that on human timescales, those are minuscule uh, effects. Okay, well, let's talk about ice for a moment. Where is most of the ice located on planet Earth? Antarctic ice sheet. And how much? I don't, I don't have a number in my head. Do you have a rough estimation or idea the, of how the much amount the of ice, ice is in The amount Antarctica? of ice in the Antarctic ice, uh, ice sheet, if melted, would raise global sea level by 200 feet. I'm not asking how feet. much. Okay, you keep well, going. Well, you did ask you, how much. You don't ask the, answer the question. My question is how much of the ice on the Earth is in Antarctica? I'm not asking you to expound on anything else. I'm trying to limit you to that particular question. Don't know the answer. Do you have any idea? I wouldn't want to speculate in this forum. Well, would it surprise you if it's as high as 85 to 90 percent, that that's generally where the estimates are of the total amount of ice on Earth is in Antarctica? It would not surprise me. And would it surprise you to know that as global uh, temperatures rise, assuming for the moment that they do, that that actually increases the amount of ice that is collected on Antarctica? That's not true, sir. That's not true. Well, I made a trip down to Antarctica and met with National Science Foundation scientists, and they all agreed with global warming, and they emphasized that you're going to have an increase in the amount of ice in Antarctica because of global warming. Now, have you ever studied, I understand you've studied climate, but how, do, how about meteorology? Have you ever studied meteorology? I have, and, and okay, I'll... Okay, so you we understand have, that as the temperature we gets have warmer, satellite can records. Contain, sir, wait we a have second. Please, uh, you've answered my question. I, I don't want you to orate mm -hmm. because I have limited time. Uh, if, the, if the chair would uh, please permit, uh, as I try to get this point across. Okay, with that objection, the gentleman is recognized for another 30 seconds. Do you understand that as temperatures rise, more moisture is contained in the atmosphere, and then that moisture in Antarctica collects on land, and it takes hundreds and hundreds of years for that ice that is deposited on Antarctica to actually ever even reach the shoreline where it touches the oceans where it can affect, uh, in some way, a sea level increases? We have satellite records uh, clearly documenting a, a shrinkage of the Antarctic ice sheet and an acceleration of that shrinkage. I'm sorry, but I don't know where you're getting your information, but the scientific data well, that I have National seen National Snow and Ice Data Center. Well, okay, I'm talking the National NASA Air and other, Aeronautics okay. and Space Administration. Well, you, I've got a NASA base in my district, and apparently they're telling you one thing and, and me a different thing, but there are plenty be, of studies that have come out that show that with respect to Antarctica, that the total ice sheet, particularly that above land, is increasing, not decreasing. Now, you can make a different argument if you want to talk about Greenland or, or the Arctic. But that having been said, thank you, Mr. Chairman, you. for the Thank you, Mr. Brooks. And the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Duffy, in your testimony, you state that technology will play an essential role in minimizing and adapting to the uh, effects of, of climate change, uh, something you think the gov U.S. government should support. Uh, you allude to the economic benefits that are likely to accrue to U.S. businesses as a result of developing these new technologies. I agree that the government has an important role to play in helping U.S. businesses lead the world in technology to address climate change. Now, that's why I introduced the Bipartisan Challenges and Prizes for Climate Act, along with 13 of my uh, Democratic and Republican colleagues from the Climate Solutions Caucus. Uh, this bill requires the Department of Energy to organize prize competitions around climate challenges such as energy efficiency, grid energy storage, and carbon capture and prioritizes market-ready solutions that are made in America. This is one important way the federal government can both incentivize and raise awareness of technology to address climate change. But I'm wondering 
what you think some others might be? How else can the government leverage the, the private sector to develop technologies and solutions that we need to uh, address climate change? Well, well, thanks for the question. You know, one, one really important measure which has been mentioned uh, earlier would be to create the incentives, uh, the economic incentives, uh, to, to develop those technologies. And here, uh, putting a price on, on carbon emissions, which after all corrects uh, a market failure, is a very important step uh, which would incentivize uh, both the development uh, and implementation of, of a lot of important uh, technologies. Uh, any other, uh, well, let, let me move on. What, if we, if the United States, if, if we don't uh, really uh, help lead the world in this, what do our, what do we have to lose economically? Uh, where are we right now? Where is, where are American businesses right now uh, compared to the rest of, of the world in, in developing the, these climate solutions? And uh, if we don't do more, uh, what, do we, what do we lose economically? Well, that, that's a great question. And, and you know, in, in the immediate term, uh, no country is spending more on renewable energy uh, than, than China is. And I, you know, I would hate uh, to lose that race to them. Uh, you know, the other aspect of this that's very concerning to me uh, is the potential uh, brain drain aspect. Um, and you know, historically, the excellence of uh, American education and American research has been a magnet uh, for talented people uh, from around the world to come here, uh, and those folks have added invaluably uh, to our country in many, many ways, including economically. And in, when I look in the, the, you know, the job ads section now of international uh, scientific journals, it saddens me to see that uh, where, are, where are all the jobs now? Well, mo a lot of them are in China. Most of them are in China. Uh, and again, that, that you know, I would I would much prefer uh, to see uh, Americans investing in both the science and the technology to address this threat. I want to focus on something a little more specific. How would you characterize the nature of geoengineering or carbon removal as a, a potential option to fight climate change? You know, I, I would I would treat those separately. Uh, carbon removal uh, it, it is, a, is a, well, carbon removal in principle actually does in fact act to reverse climate change by lowering uh, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. As I mentioned in my testimony, you know, there are uh, rather low-tech land management uh, methods that can, uh, in, in some, can remove quite a bit of CO2 from the atmosphere, probably not as much as we need to, but but uh, make a really, really valuable contribution. And, and again, you know, those measures have uh, some very valuable uh, co-benefits, including, as I mentioned, benefits uh, for adaptation. Uh, technological measures to remove uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere are, are under development. Uh, at the moment, uh, they're very expensive, and at the moment, uh, we don't have the ability uh, to deploy them uh, at uh, the scale that we need. Um, you also asked about so-called geoengineering, which I would characterize as uh, measures to counteract uh, the climatic effects uh, of increasing uh, greenhouse gases. I, I don't know anyone uh, in the scientific community who's enthusiastic about uh, deployment of, of geoengineering. I think a lot of us, however, recognize that this is something we need to understand better. We need to understand the potential effectiveness, and most importantly, we need to understand uh, the potential uh, un unintended consequences. Thank you. I'm out of time. I'll yield back. And the gentleman yields back, and the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is recognized for his questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witnesses for their attendance here today. Uh, Mr. Cass and Mr. Nordhaus, uh, do you believe uh, Dr. Duffy's claim that government regulation is responsible for lowering the cost of refrigerators in this country? Or, or do you tend to believe it might be due to uh, competition and improved production and, and technical advancements? I would say probably a bit of both, and I, I don't know the specific research that he is referring to, but I would assume that a significant amount of the cost savings there were not in the actual uh, 
purchase cost of the refrigerator, but just in the energy costs associated with running it as refrigerators have begot, become more efficient. I do think that there's a case that uh, regu various regulatory measures um, ha like Energy Star, Star have um, significantly contributed to improving the efficiency, energy efficiency of refrigerators. We're, we're talking about costs. costs. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cass. I think as Mr. Nordhaus emphasized, the key distinction is between the upfront cost of a product typically and then the operating cost. And what we find with regulation is that if you, uh, and we see this now with, for instance, cafe standards, if you require people to purchase more expensive cars uh, that use less gas, you can claim to be saving them money. Uh, the problem is that typically they don't agree, and if they did, you wouldn't need the regulation. That's kind of what I thought. Uh, Dr. Duffy, you referenced a big threat from large-scale emissions of greenhouse gases from thawing permafrost. How did the greenhouse gases get captured into the permafrost in 15 seconds or less? It's, uh, it's dead organic matter, okay. dead animals and plants. All right. Uh, what was the temperature on Earth before the last ice age? Before the last ice age and the last, yes, sir. The last interglacial, uh, well, similar to what, what it was about 100 years ago. You think? You don't think maybe it was 30 degrees warmer when dinosaurs roamed the Earth? There certainly have been uh, epochs in the past uh, when uh, the global temperature was warmer than it is now, and there's evidence that during those epochs there was massive release uh, of greenhouse gases uh, from uh, frozen ground, previously frozen ground. Well, where did the greenhouse gases come from if we didn't have people to create them? Oh, uh, again, you know, the greenhouse gases that are, are, are tied up in permafrost, or the carbon, there's not really gases, but the carbon that's tied up in permafrost uh, is uh, undecayed or organic matter. So air. that's a threat that would exist if people never existed? It's a threat that would exist, but the, the activities of people are unlocking that threat by warming the Arctic uh, and causing that what, frozen what, ground to How fall. many ice ages do you think we've had on this planet? Uh, dozens. Okay. Um, but, you know, what just because it's happened end, before doesn't mean it's benign. <laughs> what, what caused the end of the last ice age? Uh, the ice ages are caused uh, by uh, oscillations in uh, Earth's orbital parameters. I'd yeah, the last one was caused by a cataclysmic collision of an asteroid on this planet, I believe. Um, uh, what, what, what do you say to people who uh, theorize that the Earth, as it continues to uh, warm, is returning to its uh, normal temperature? Look, you know, if you want to, if you want to characterize uh, a temperature uh, above today's temperature as normal. Uh, you, you're free to do that, but that doesn't mean uh, that's a, a planet that we want to live on. Uh, if we let uh, the I, Earth, I, I, I don't want to get philosophical. I'm, I'm not getting philosophical. I'm, get, I'm, I'm getting I'm, I'm getting extremely you know, I think practical. We all, I, you're what? I'm being extremely practical. Yeah. Uh, well, if if we let the planet warm two or three degrees, we will have tens of meters of sea level rise, and and the community where I live uh, will essentially cease to exist. We, I don't think anybody disputes that the Earth is getting warmer. Mm -hmm. I, I think what's not clear is the exact amount of who caused what. And, and getting, getting to that is, I think, where we're trying to go with this committee, just a little bit understanding yeah. of exactly uh, how much uh, different causes contribute sure. well, uh, to you know, warming I, look, that we're I, I encourage you to look at the, the, the last... Assessment report of the of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change estimated the human contribution uh, to warming over the last 60 or 70 years is essentially equal uh, to the observed warming. In other words, they're saying uh, humans caused essentially all of the observed warming over the last when, when 60, 70 think, years. When do you think the, the, the turn was made from the 70s prediction that we were going to have another ice age, and that was the big threat they were telling us when I was in in well, the, the, the scientific community in the 70s never actually widely predicted uh, an immediate cooling. Uh, there were a few popular press articles about it, but it was n never something that was widely believed in the scientific community. The, gen the gentleman's time has expired.
And the gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. Esty, is recognized for her questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for joining us here today for this important hearing. Um, I want to note, Mr. Nordhaus, I want to thank you as a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for your importantly making sure everyone on this committee and anyone watching understands that how much of the contribution towards carbon and how much of the fuel consumption, the carbon consumption, is related to the transportation and others and the industrial sectors. Um, and that is why it's so important on that committee. And we welcome um, your testimony on that in front of the TNI committee to make that point. But I do think it also underscores the importance of technological innovation in a variety of sectors. Uh, it cannot be an appropriate answer to say the rest of the world doesn't develop its technology or doesn't advance economically, but the U.S. is uniquely positioned, I would say, to advance research in all of those realms, which is why we have innovation being done in the Department of Defense, which has invested heavily because 30 percent of its costs are in the cost of transportation and has recognized the value it places, as well as the DOD, seeing the threat of sea level rise being enormously threatening to global security, as well as threatening our bases. So that is real cost right now. And, uh, and if any of you have the figures on that, we can also get you to those, because those are real costs, and DOD is really worried about them right now. And that is going to impact taxpayer dollars, as well as military preparedness, something that is not integrated often enough in this committee. Um, I hail from the state of Connecticut. We are one of the Reggie states, uh, Dr. Duffy, who have lived in several of them, California and Connecticut. In my state of Connecticut, which has decided to lean in to a lower carbon future because it sees both the short and the long-term advantages of that. That is created with our first in the nation green bank, over 13,000 jobs. Those are jobs they are selling technology out of my district around the world. We have fuel cells that are being sold in Korea. We're the largest supplier of fuel cells to Korea, in part as part of that carbon transition. Um, if we were to lean away from that, I think about this being like insurance for a car, or better yet, insurance on your house. I've never lived in a house that is burned down, but I get insurance anyway. The concerns, and there's a lot of debate, especially with my colleagues, saying exactly what percentage is due to human behavior. But if the consequences, if the most extreme predictions are right, are cataclysmic for the continuation of life on Earth for human beings, then it would seem prudent that we at least take some measure of action. So Dr. Duffy, could you talk about both the opportunity that we have from the business point of view, which is, I think, in part, why so much of the business community leaned in on, say, the Paris Climate Accords. U.S. business leaned in and said, yes, we want to support this, because they see that business opportunity to sell to the entire world. And could you also talk about the research importance? We are very concerned, and we've talked a lot in this committee, about China's investment across the board in research and getting ahead of us, whether it's on solar technology or other things, that they will then license to the world. Uh, so, Dr. Duffy, if you could talk a little bit about those business opportunities and imperatives as decision makers about what we can do. Sure, and I'd be, I'd be happy to address that. And I'll, I'll also just echo your comments about uh, uh, REGI, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And, and uh, as you, I'm sure you know, a number of studies have shown uh, positive economic impacts in the nearly 10 years uh, that Reggie has been in place, and and, and some of those some of those positive uh, impacts, by the way, come from improved health outcomes. I think the latest study uh, documented 5.7 billion dollars uh, in savings because of improved uh, health outcomes. Uh, regarding uh, you know research on technologies and 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 the business opportunity, uh, I, you know again I I think it's it's an important opportunity. Um, the world has uh, this global threat. Uh, it will take global cooperation to address this threat. Uh, and, and, you know, look, we're, we're the United States. We should be, we should be leaders here, uh, not followers. It's as simple as that, in my view. Can you flag what, what are some of the research elements that you think the federal government is uniquely positioned to do the basic research? Because obviously the private sector is going to do that R&D, but 
but that basic research, whether it be fusion, which we have a variety of opinions you've heard here about fusion, but certainly if we were to be successful with fusion, that would be transformative. What are some of those other areas? No, I think in, in general, you know, where the federal government has a role is in the early stage research where, there, where you know, the economic payoff uh, is, is, is doubtful uh, or is, is, is a ways down the road, and, and, and fusion uh, would certainly be an example of that. Thank you, and I see I'm out of time. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Esty. And the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, gentlemen, for being here uh, to testify today. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Mr. Cass, in your written materials, you cite two studies, one by Little, or excuse me, one by Mills and one by uh, Becerra, or Bere Bereka, I guess is the, I, I had that wrong. <laughs> um, they, they take two different approaches to mortality uh, rates with, uh, uh, due to extreme temperature. Um, and you said uh, in there, uh, I mean, let, let's talk about that for just a second. Why they both took different approaches? Why did they take different approaches? What what were they looking for, and and why did they traverse the path that they did? Sure, I, I think the Mills study is kind of the quintessential example of ignoring adaptation. Uh, they look at different cities and assume that as temperatures change, cities will not change their response. Uh, and as a result, they produce very large cost estimates. Uh, the Bereka work, I think, is much more interesting and useful. They actually look at response to high temperatures over time. And so instead of just developing a, a homogenous response for, say, the second half of the 20th century, they say, let's compare what happened in the first half to the second half, or let's compare the 1960s to the 1990s. Uh, and by looking at it in those terms and by taking the adoption of air conditioning into account in particular, what they find is that by the 1990s, uh, mortality related to heat has plummeted. Uh, and essentially, they find a, a decline of about 80% from the first half to the second half, uh, a decline of about half within the second half. And by 2004, looking at the level of air conditioning that's been adopted, uh, the effect of heat on mortality is no longer statistically significant. Uh, and have you had a chance to engage with any of these researchers to kind of find out why they took the, the, the path they took? Uh, I've had a number of exchanges, with some of them as I was doing the research, some of them more recently to sort of uh, ask if, I, if I've missed anything or, or to understand the approach they're taking. You know, one response I'll hear is, well, we were only trying to show what we were trying to show. So a study is... We stated our assumptions, and, and you can make of it whatever you want. Um, another response is to say, first of all, yes, we do point out that we don't take adaptation into account. Uh, and then, in fact, if you look elsewhere in the report, you'll see uh, we also provide an alternative calculation <coughs> with adaptation. So even the Mills study, for instance, actually also says, well, what if we assume that cities do adapt? Even just assume everyone gets as good as Dallas at dealing with heat. Uh, and just with that basic assumption, they find their cost estimate, I believe, falls by about two-thirds. Uh, the interesting thing is that, that sh that's the more interesting finding, but that's reported as an aside. It's not something the Obama EPA chose to then incorporate in the estimate of cost that it highlighted. Well, I happen to come from the Phoenix metro area, which is one of the hottest areas <laughs> in the United States. And... and uh, if you look back 70 years ago, there was about 100,000 people in the day. The, the metro area is 5 million people. So I guess my question to you is, have, have studies been done to determine what the variables, or what, what uh, not variables, but the, um, what activities have come, to, come about through adaptation to make, let's say, life more uh, bearable in the desert? I mean, I, I think the best evidence suggests air conditioning. You know, bold looking more broadly at the economic decision of so many uh, people to move to the Southwest. Uh, and even today, we see continued movement to the Southeast. Uh, and, and the analyses of mortality suggest that adopting air conditioning is the best explanation of why you don't see more mortality. I would also say just that I think there's an important lesson to be drawn from the fact that uh, Americans looking at their options, taking everything that they wish to take into account, are choosing to move further south. They are voluntarily opting for hotter temperatures uh, and I love the heat by the way there you go <laughs> that you know that sort of behavior um, again underscores that 
places deal with the climates that they have, and there are pros and cons to whatever climate you have, uh, and it is not correct to simply assume that uh, if the climate changes, people will behave as they did in the past. Thank you, and I just have a, about 20 seconds left. Um, Mr. Nordham, Norhouse, you mentioned um, that you, would, you felt like we should incentivize clean fuel. What would you do to incentivize clean fuel? Well, I think the most important thing is making, uh, uh, taking steps to drive down the cost of the underlying technologies, um, you know, whether that's electricity technologies, transportation technologies. How would you do that, though? Um, R&D uh, programs to demonstrate and commercialize um, some early who, stage support. Who would do that? Pardon? Who would do that? Um, I think there are a variety of uh, measures that could be taken at both the state and federal level. Thank you. And Mr. Thank you, Mr. Biggs. And the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, is recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. Um, let's see. First, I'd like an opportunity to clear up this question about refrigerator capital costs and efficiency. Uh, Dr. Duffy is the only one with an actual technical background on this uh, on this set of panel of witnesses. Can you just try to clarify this a little bit? Sure. Uh, the study was the study I'm referring to was done. I don't remember when, by the California Energy Commission. Uh, and the costs in question were the purchase price of refrigerators, not the lifetime energy costs. Correct. And so that the federal regulations regarding efficiency of refrigerators resulted in not only a reduction in the electrical cost over time, but also the purchase price, presumably because that you can have a smaller motor, et cetera, and a compressor. I think that's and right. And I, I, you know, my guess is that what, what, what's happened is that at, at the onset, uh, and it was both federal and state regulations, at the onset of those regulations, uh, the companies were making refrigerators the same way uh, they had for decades. Uh, because it worked and, and they were making money and everything was fine. And, and I, I believe that the, you know, the advent of regulation caused the engineers to take another look at it and not surprisingly uh, they realized that, gee, we've progressed and we now know how to do things yep. better than we did 20 years ago. Well, thank you. And that's a different narrative than we often hear in this. Um, no, staying with technical um, uh, questions here, uh, uh, Mr. Cass, can you explain uh, the, uh, the plans that shellfish have to use air conditioning to adapt to climate change? Uh, I'm not familiar with any. It turns out that as a relative cost of climate change, though, and it is one that EPA took into account, uh, it, it barely even shows up on the chart. And so my suggestion would not be that adaptation takes care of everything, as I, I think emphasized several times. There are certainly real costs to climate change, uh, but the, the scale of those costs uh, does not look anything like the type of cataclysmic rhetoric that we are hearing uh, from some members of this committee, uh, to some degree from some members of this panel, and also uh, from the dollar estimates that, for instance, the EPA produced. Uh, but uh, all right, there, there are difficulties here where you talk about economic modeling of the intergenerational wealth transfers. You know, by, for example, underinvesting in research on low carbon technologies, high efficiency technology, and so on, we are imposing huge costs on the next generation. And, uh, you know, those are, those are a real costs that should be modeled and are, are almost impossible to. Now, you, on the other hand, don't always need a complete, uh, a complete calculation, an accurate calculation, to know that we're making big mistakes. And so that from what you know of the rough estimates that have been made, is it clear that we are underinvesting in uh, technologies? And actually, Mr. Nordhaus, you know, for example, the, the big uh, cuts that were proposed by the Trump administration to research, uh, fundamental research on energy efficiency and other green technologies. Uh, is that something which you believe is a step in the wrong direction as a society? I would say that cutting federal investment in energy research development and demonstration is unwise. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cass, have you seen an economic analysis that would contradict that conclusion? Oh, I would agree with that, and my testimony specifically uh, thanks Congress for, for maintaining that funding, and I think there's a good case for increasing it. But I do think it's also important to recognize that uh, just as we ask the climate scientists to provide the best possible science on climate, we also need to ask economists to provide the best possible economics on climate. And if you look at the economics for climate change that are being produced, uh, the cost estimates that they're delivering are not defensible. And, and so how, I'm open how, to... How do you economically model, for example, the cost of the extinction of a species? 
I think that's very difficult to model economically, and I think that's a very valid cost to highlight as a cost of climate change. Uh, but I think we also, when we are talking about economic costs, need to be realistic about what they are. And so when you describe the huge costs that we're imposing on future generations, uh, we need to define what those are. And certainly neither EPA nor GAO uh, managed to find those. So, so you would advocate then uh, for more effort in uh, get more accurately defining the, um, the climate, uh, the, the costs of future climate change? Yes, absolutely, and I think it's critical in doing that to emphasize that adaptation is not something to be put to the side. Adaptation is the central question uh, to what the costs will be, and in many respects to what the best policy responses will be. We need to understand what are the things we're going to adapt to fairly naturally, what are the things we're going to adapt to but with cost. Uh, air conditioning, for instance, is not free. Uh, it, that has costs too. Uh, and what, if anything, are the things that uh, maybe we ha will have difficulty adapting to and we need contingency plans for. I have not heard good definitions of things that it's difficult to conceive of society adapting for to, but I certainly think that's an exercise we should be asking about. Any comments, uh, Mr. Nordhausen? Yeah, I, I think that there are just huge uncertainties um, both ways. Uh, when we try to look out a century and think about you know, what we can adapt to, what we can't adapt to, uh, what uh, the costs of mitigation uh, will be. They're just, we don't know. Um, so you have and to- yeah, And yeah, you both yeah. conclude that we're underinvesting as a society yeah. in-, yeah. Um, in a Absolutely, and I, I would just make one other point, um, which is that I, I do wanna, um, there are un, very difficult to quantify, if un, not unquantifiable risks of quite rapid impacts, and I think as uh, Mr. Cass has also recognized, uh, very rapid change would be much more costly and difficult um, to adapt to, and we just don't know, uh, and I think it will, I don't think more climate science, science is likely to help us better understand the likelihoods on the time frames that we would need to take action to address them. So that's not an argument against climate science, but we should understand what sorts of uncertainties we're likely to be able to resolve and what sorts of uncertainties we're unlikely to resolve. Well, thank you, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting that you both agree that actions like the recent cancellation of NASA's carbon monitoring system are actually also steps in the wrong direction. We need more information on the time scale at which this problem will bite us. Uh, okay. Thank you, and I yield uh, back. Thank you, Mr. Foster. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cass, uh, you mentioned a study by the EPA that found that Pittsburgh extreme heat mortality will rise exponentially beyond levels even in Phoenix or Houston. So I've got a couple of questions for you. Is it true that the closer to the equator you get, the warmer it is? Uh, generally speaking, I believe that's right. You believe that's right from your geography back in the sixth grade? And traveling south from time to time. Well, you need to come to Galveston and spend lots of money. Um, I owned an air conditioning company for over 35 years. So when you start, and by the way, we loved seasons changing. We loved heat in Texas. Um, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, a couple things from being in business 35 years. We're not experiencing mass, mass casualties. Now, Rep. Congressman Dunn from Arizona said that he loved the heat too. Uh, over in Arizona, they've got a drier heat. Of course, we have a more humid heat. Um, so I want you, Mr. Cass, to, to expand on wh what's wrong with two things, if you can. I realize one's more scientific and one's a little less. What's wrong with the study, prediction of study mortality in Pittsburgh, which is arguably further up north and a lot further away from the air equator than we are there in Texas, um, that they think there would be 75 more times of mortalities in, in Phoenix, in the, or, I'm sorry, in Pittsburgh, than in Phoenix or in Houston. Number one, what's wrong with that study? And number two, isn't that a bit hyperbole to create some kind of need to really push forward on, on more regulations? You're so, up. thank you. The, the technical way of describing the problem, I think, is to say that uh, the study assumes all things are held constant. And of course, that's traditionally how we expect economic analysis. But let me interject done. here real quick. So if that was true, we're closer to the equator. If it was getting hotter in Pittsburgh, would it be getting hotter in Texas? Would that be a safe assumption? Yes. At, a, at the same rate? 
Uh, there are variations, but generally speaking. Okay, keep going. Uh, so I think the, the way to understand the problem is that they identified an effect of extreme heat days in Pittsburgh on mortality and assumed that a day of that heat level will always have the same effect, even if Pittsburgh's climate changes. That's a very poor assumption to make because we can see what places with warmer climates look like and how they respond to temperatures. And we know that they respond differently from Pittsburgh. And so if you're going to uh, try to project how Pittsburgh would respond to a warmer climate, you need to look at how people in warmer climates respond. You, you can't assume that Pittsburgh is going to respond as if it you, still has You buy adequate climate. air conditioning. I can tell from experience how that happens in Gulf Coast. That's exactly right. There are, and, and I think it's important to point out when we talk about adaptation that you know technological adaptation, and, and certainly that's the title of the hearing, is, is only one form of adaptation. There are biophysical adaptations. People do get used to the heat. There are behavioral adaptations. Uh, there are economic adaptations. There are social adaptations. There's uh, probably a certain number of people in Pittsburgh who don't buy air conditioning because of the cost, because they figure they can tough it out in the warmer times, because it has a cooler climate more often, more so than Texas does. And then even though 71 degrees to us is, is very, very cool, you know, Texas can be 95, 100, 105. And they, when they get caught with higher temperature, and that, that, in my opinion, that should be 90, 95, or 100, depending on how much ventilation is in that home then people could suffer heat strokes and be in real dire na danger. Do you think that's part of the hype, the study? It's part of the hype trying to force more regulations on the energy industry? Well, I, so just to clarify, the 71 degrees is the low. So a day with a low of 71 is a warm day. But I think you're exactly right that people in Pittsburgh uh, are not going to respond to one very warm day a year the way they would respond if they had 30. Absolutely. And so... Uh, you would expect to see them behave differently in the context of a changing climate. I do think uh, that part of the impetus for not including good analyses of adaptation in top-line cost estimates uh, is to create large top-line cost estimates. And the fact that a lot of these analyses actually do provide analyses with adaptation, but put those off to the side as an alternative case instead of as the main case, uh, I think is one of the problems. Well, I, I will tell you that... If I could offer a, a comment on... on, on no, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Okay. I'm running out of time. I can sure. tell you from experience, 35 years in the air conditioning business, that the higher the efficiency ratings went up and the price was driven up, the less likely customers were to buy it. They were hard-pressed to say, go spend six or $7,000 for a new air conditioning system. All of a sudden, you've created one now where you've got to be a more efficient, better compressors and more f coil space, and now those are eight or $9,000. They're having trouble coming up with a six much less the eight or nine. So what do they do? They fix the old clunker that's terribly in energy inefficient and keep it going for yet another year. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weber. And the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Lamb, is recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before I ask any questions, I'll, I'll just testify as a southwestern Pennsylvanian that the good people of Pittsburgh are going to be just fine. Uh, we have throughout our, our history, and I think our our record of uh, sports championships helps testify to the toughness that we have. Obviously, we're very concerned about how costly these changes will be, especially in a part of a country like ours. People are elderly, and the, the cost of cooling your home an extra five degrees will be difficult uh, for people living on Social Security and pensions. Um, but just wanted to, to make that comment. I also, Mr. Chairman, if it's all right, would like to introduce a study uh, without objection. It is from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. It addresses the issue of uh, ice losses in the Antarctic that was discussed earlier. Um, Dr. Duffy was asked several questions about it. And this is just meant simply to show that it is a complicated issue and that it was, it was government-funded NASA research that has really helped, um, helped us improve our understanding of this complicated okay, with that topic. Without objection, that will be made a part of the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, now, Dr. Norhouse, if, or Mr. Norhouse, I'm sorry, if I could ask you a question about uh, the importance of America's nuclear plants. Your, your testimony noted that it's important to keep these plants open, um, and you noted a few things, state and federal clean energy standards, intervention at FERC, and other measures that could do this. Could you just briefly expand on that? What, what are some other options we have to help these nuclear plants that are at risk of closing? I think properly valuing both the reliability and the low carbon uh, nature of the electricity they produce. Um, uh, would, And there are a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, uh, 
Uh, I think that many states with nuclear plants that are uh, threatened with closures uh, also have uh, renewable portfolio standards, and if we transition those to clean energy standards, we could both significantly raise the bar in terms of what the requirements for zero carbon energy in those states was, uh, keep those plants online uh, for quite a while longer. and. At some point, if um, it makes sense to close them and replace them with other, uh, we will know they'll be replaced with other zero carbon options as opposed to fossil fuel uh, powered options. So, and are you aware of efforts in uh, New Jersey, Illinois, New York to do exactly that? Do you support those yeah, efforts? Yeah, I support all of those efforts, uh, and again, would only uh, suggest that we'd be much better served moving from a sort of one-off bailing out nuclear plants plant by plant to a uh, more uh, um, a broader strategy to increase low carbon energy on the grid by keeping all of our nuclear plants operating. Right. Um, I also wanted to ask about R&D spending. I've read a report recently from Boston Consulting Group, and it suggests that the U.S. still leads the world in front-end basic R&D spending, like in basic research, but that where we have been surpassed by China is in actually bringing these technologies to the market. And now they're spending more than us in that regard. Um, can you talk about what we could do at our national labs or elsewhere to close that gap and try to get more American-funded research to the market in America and elsewhere? Yeah, I, I think there's an old idea about R&D, which is that there's this sort of thing called basic science that you put in a box um, and you fund that and then sort of private firms take that and do things with it. Um, I think that uh, when you look at the Chinese model, uh, it's very much state-led. I think that uh, in the US, when you really look at most of our greatest successes, certainly in energy, but in many, many other technological arenas, what we've really seen are pub public-private partnerships um, where um, uh, there is significant public support for applied research, um, often, First of a kind technologies are quite costly um, uh, to build, whether it's your first nuclear plant or your first uh, big carbon capture facility, uh, and those things do require uh, public support. Private sector isn't going to do it alone. And just um, lastly, before we run out of time, you had mentioned earlier uh, the idea of federal and state combinations. I think you mentioned a, a federal transportation project uh, or demonstration uh, for when, when you were asked about clean fuel earlier and how we might bring that to market. Could you just elaborate that on, on that a little bit? Yeah, I think that um, there are uh, a variety of efforts, longstanding efforts actually, um, to sort of get these technologies to market. Um, and it's been both state and federal policy uh, that sort of have gotten us to the point where we do have uh, cleaner fuel a vehicles and electric specific vehicles. example. Do you have like a specific example to illustrate that? Uh, you know, uh, going back even to the 90s, there was um, a big federal uh, partnership with the automakers uh, to um, uh, on battery technology um, that really sort of uh, uh, established the trajectory that we're on now in terms of electric vehicles. So that would be one. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. And the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, is recognized. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses as well. Uh, Mr. Nordhaus, um, it is unrealistic to assume that we will be able to rely on renewable energy like wind and solar in the near future for all of our energy needs. Is that, is that a true or false statement? That would be my view. Okay. How do we decide when it's time to reduce wind and solar subsidies <clears throat> to allow the market to take over? I think that with mature wind and solar technologies, which is mostly what we're subsidizing now, um, there is general agreement, including among proponents of those technologies, that they are competitive in many contexts with fossil fuel technologies. I think we're probably at the point where we ought to put that proposition to the test. Um, and scale back subsidies. Now, I do think that there are probably a range of advanced renewable uh, technologies that we may want to continue to provide some support for. Um, but when you're looking at cheap solar, 15% efficiency solar panels that are being mass produced in China, I'm not quite sure why we're, uh, you know, paying, uh, uh, you know, uh, substantially 
continuing to subsidize them. I got you, and I agree with you 100%. I'd be happy to add a comment on that, if I may. Well, I'm not through just yet. Uh, we had the Department of Energy secretary here uh, just last week, and <clears throat> we brought out the fact that uh, uh, some federal agencies were, were had, had formerly been uh, uh, articulating and, and uh, reporting on the amount of subsidies compared uh, for for solar versus fossil fuel versus wind, et cetera. And uh, it was astounding to see just a few years ago, uh, like four years ago, that we were spending some, something like 15 times more uh, subsidizing uh, solar than we were, say, fossil fuels. Uh, in fact, even 100 times in some cases. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, this agency that was reporting this Went, went silent. We're not, we're not able to see those uh, reports uh, over the last few years. And uh, I, we don't know whether that's whether they don't want the, the public to see these uh, huge discrepancies or, or what the reason is, but uh, the, the uh, Secretary Perry said that he was going to look into this and, and start uh, uh, printing these reports out again. Uh, thank you. Uh, why is it important, Mr. Nordhaus, uh, that the U.S. not stand in the way of developing countries' efforts to build and improve infrastructure, even if it means more fossil fuel consumption? Well, as I noted earlier, the, when it comes to infrastructure, that's what makes us adaptable and resilient to a changing climate and to just existing climate extremes. So if you're concerned about the impacts of climate change on poor populations in the developing world, the most important thing that they can do certainly over the next couple of decades is build infrastructure. And right now a lot of that infrastructure uh, still requires fossil fuels. So uh, we should be um, clear-eyed about the trade-offs between mitigation and adaptation in those particular contexts. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Cass, in your testimony, you mentioned that the Mills study included an alternative analysis from its main findings that excluded uh, human adaptive response to temperatures. Uh, do most temperature studies that you have analyzed come with such a disclaimer uh, to the public uh, that human ability to adapt is not considered a factor? Usually the study itself will state that, and I would say fairly clearly. If you if you go and find the original report and read it, uh, you can understand what they're doing. I think the problem is that by the time it gets summarized up to the GO, GAO summary to policymakers, certainly by the time it gets reported in the newspaper, um, that kind of context is either lost entirely or, or put down at the bottom, uh, when in fact it's the very heart of the issue. Okay, and then also, uh, back to you, Mr. Nordhaus, you testified that the U.S. carbon emissions are lower today than what would have been mandated by the Waxman-Markey legislation in 2009 that failed to pass Congress. Uh, what has been the primary <clears throat> driver in this reduction? The biggest single driver has been the shale gas revolution, uh, which I would note, um, you know, is a classic example of the sort of public-private partnership to develop, commercialize, cheap, scalable technology uh, that we need a lot more of. Um, I think that I will also note that um, once upon a time we thought of natural gas as a bridge fuel in the power sector uh, from high carbon to low carbon intensity. Uh, I think when you look at uh, the record, uh, having looked at generation shares in the power sector over the last decade. I think there's a pretty strong case that natural gas is doing, uh, mostly doing exactly that, that it has been displacing coal and that in more recent years a lot of natural gas generation has been displaced by wind, um, which is the other, the second largest driver of falling emissions in the power sector. And I can, I can vouch for that because my home district of southeast Texas uh, had a brand new biomass plant uh, meant to uh, take wood products and convert them into electricity to be sold on, on the grid. And yet, uh, with just a few short years later, this brand new plant is now sitting idle because of the cheap natural gas feedstocks that we have today. So anyway, thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Babin. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Christ, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am from Florida. I. Uh, and first, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. I appreciate your time. Um, I represent 
uh, on the west coast of Florida, Pinellas County, which is St. Petersburg, Clearwater area. Uh, Pinellas County happens to be a peninsula. Um, and Florida, as you're aware, is a peninsula also. And, and some make the argument that Florida may be the state that is most susceptible to rising sea levels. Um, having said that, Dr. Duffy, I'd like to ask you, what would you say are the uh, three greatest causes of climate change, if you can do that? Well, there's really two uh, major causes, and, and the first is, uh, well, human emissions of greenhouse gases generally, uh, and that comes from uh, two sources. One is burning of fossil fuels, uh, and the other is, is land use practices uh, like deforestation and also agriculture. Uh, agriculture historically has released uh, a, a large quantity of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. How so? Uh, through uh, tilling of soil. Uh, it's, agriculture also releases other greenhouse gases besides CO2, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, methane through livestock, largely uh, nitrous oxide through, through fertilizers. Uh, uh, agriculture food production is uh, a, a very significant source of human greenhouse gas emissions. You said that the first uh, cause is human emissions. Is that how you described it? The, Yes, sir, and, and, and within the category of human emissions, the, the, the biggest contribution historically has been uh, burning of fossil fuels. And uh, what would be the uh, simplest way to stem the tide of that level of fossil fuel burning? Well, the, 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 what, what, what needs to happen is adoption of uh, carbon-free uh, energy sources, as we've been discussing here this morning. And which do you think are the most effective? Well, as I said, you know, I would, I would, I would argue for uh, accelerated deployment of the technologies we have today, uh, which are mainly uh, wind and solar. Uh, I think Mr. Nordhaus has argued uh, persuasively for the, the need to uh, keep nuclear power uh, in the mix, and I agree with that. Uh, but but those those are the technologies that we have today. I, I, I do also support uh, the development of, of new technologies and new ideas. You know, when you think about um, how uh, much we utilize coal, fossil fuels uh, uh, as a energy source, um, and automobiles are are I assume a, a big contributor uh, to carbon emissions uh, as well. Um, if we had all cars become electric, would that have a significant impact on the reduction of emissions? It, it would. Uh, in the United States transportation sector, which is, of course, more than just cars, transportation sector uh, contributes roughly 25 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, in California, where I've, I've spent most of my life, uh, it's actually a much higher proportion, uh, almost 50 percent, 40, 50 percent. Um, you know, certain because uh, of the amount of automobiles, we drive a lot in California. Sure, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I agree uh, with with Mr. Nordhaus that you know certain parts of the transportation sector are pretty easy to electrify, and cars are certainly an example of that. I mean, we have electric cars now; they're great. I drive one. Uh, other parts of the transportation sector will be much, much more difficult. We haven't mentioned aviation, but that's probably the best example. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I yield back. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Christ. And the gentleman from California, Mr. Ticano, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Duffy, did you have anything more to say about renewables, uh, claims being made about uh, the viability of renewables? Yeah, well, I, on, the, on the economics, I mean, there are, and I guess there's conflicting figures, but fossil fuels have certainly uh, been heavily subsidized as well, and, and I've seen figures suggesting that fossil fuels are actually more heavily subsidized uh, than renewables. Uh, the other thing that's important to mention about costs is that uh, for fossil fuels, uh, there are tremendous environmental costs uh, associated with those use of fossil fuels, which are not reflected in the price. Uh, and we've been focusing today on the climate consequences of fossil fuel use, but there's also very, very important public health consequences. Uh, and uh, just to give you an example, uh, particulate pollution uh, from use of coal, even today, uh, 
uh, kills about 10,000 Americans a year. Now that number has come down dramatically uh, in large part because of uh, EPA regulation uh, on, on coal burning power plants. And I'd also add to that that if you look, uh, if you compare mortality uh, from coal use in China to mortality from coal use in the U.S., and I'm not talking about different amounts of coal being used, I'm saying it, per ton of coal burned, uh, the mortality in the United States is 20 times less uh, than that uh, in China. And that's because we very effect, have very effectively uh, and cost effectively regulated uh, the air pollution uh, from use from coal burning. Yeah, I, I'm curious about something. It, um, I, I struggle with this idea of uh, nuclear power uh, being a uh, carbon-free source. I mean, it's, uh, it's no doubt, I mean, part, uh, I hear you saying that you agree with Mr. Nordhaus that you don't want to rule it out as part of the mix that we need to employ to reduce the amount of carbon we emit. Um, is there, but isn't there some problem that we have with managing the spent fuel, uh, isn't there some enormous subsidy that the government will have to, or, or at least use the leverage of its power to force communities who don't really want to have the risk of uh, the spent fuel in their uh, backyard or nearby um, for those communities that uh, do produce the, the, the fuel? Uh, but presumably everybody would benefit from it. There are some generalized, uh, socialized good that comes from it, but uh, how do we think about this? Well, look, uh, nuclear power is not without its issues, and you, you mentioned uh, disposal of spent fuel. Uh, there's, you know, also legitimate concerns about uh, weapons uh, proliferation. Uh, I, I will say, you know, a couple points, though. I mean, it, it, it can be used effectively at one point. I think France, uh, the country of France generated 80 percent of their electricity uh, from nuclear power. Um, I, I would also say that, you know, the, the safety issues uh, with nuclear power have been greatly uh, exaggerated, and, and not to say they don't exist, but if you look at the actual safety record of nuclear power uh, in the United States, I don't think there's been one human death attributed uh, to nuclear power in the United States, and that's remarkable. And as I said, fossil fuels are extraordinarily uh, dangerous. Even, you know, even solar panels, there's, there's some amount of mortality. Uh, people fall off roofs and so on. Yeah, this is a, a much deeper conversation, I would say, but uh, a, re a recent report by the Department of Defense on climate risk to uh, DOD infrastructure was, uh, that was recently submitted to Congress was determined to have had significant edits made from a draft version from December 2016. Major changes in the report uh, include omission of references to climate change. Um, Dr. Duffy, how important is it to ensure that accurate scientific assessments regarding impacts due to climate change uh, be made available to the broader public and to our military specifically. Well, no, thanks for the question. I, I the, the, you know, the military leaders that I've talked to uh, clearly recognize uh, the threat that uh, global climate change poses for their operations and their warfighting uh, capabilities, and I, I, I think that that threat uh, needs to be recognized. And I would hate to see our uh, fighting men and women placed at unnecessary risk uh, because. We're afraid to confront uh, this threat. Yeah, well, what are the dangers of uh, playing down the role of climate impacts on infrastructure, both military and non military, uh, to try and stay, in order to try and stay, quote unquote, apolitical? But, excuse me, that, you know, the danger is that we don't build the right infrastructure, you know, and, and we, we do, uh, we, we have a, uh, we face a backlog of, of, decaying infrastructure in this country, of infrastructure of all sorts, not just transportation infrastructure, energy infrastructure, so on. We need to invest in new infrastructure. And as we do that, and I've been involved in some major uh, water infrastructure projects in California, and you know the, these, these major physical infrastructures typically are designed to last 50 or 100 years. And, and you know what we did uh, when we designed water infrastructure in California is to think ahead and what is the climate and hydrology of the next 50 or 100 years uh, going to look like, and that's what those the, the water agencies in California do, and that's what we should do generally. We need to design the infrastructure around uh, the climate of the future, not the climate uh, of the past. Thank you. My time is up, uh, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ticano. Uh, let me thank uh, you all for being here today. I think this was a very worthwhile discussion of various uh, challenges that we face, and I was really pleased to see more
agreement than disagreement on the need and reliance upon uh, innovation and technology in the future to address uh, climate change as well. I appreciate the uh, testimony and the manner today. You all reflected the moderation and uh, uh, humility uh, that Mr. Nordhaus mentioned, and we have not always had that when we've discussed this subject. So uh, appreciate uh, both, as I say, what you said and, and how you said it. Uh, so thanks again for being here. Uh, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional written comments and questions from members, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>